baby making is embracing technology around the world. In India, artificial intelligence is helping improve IVF treatment for infertile couples. We have seen this technology evolve slowly and now by leaps and bounds. In Denmark, go inside what's claimed to be the world's largest sperm bank, where demand is booming. Well, good sperm should be swimming <laughs> straight ahead. It shouldn't go round in circles. It shouldn't lie still. A Singapore engineer has come up with a low-tech way to help sperm reach the egg during sex. I wanted to create something that couples can use in the privacy of their home to help them conceive faster. Meet a Japanese entrepreneur breaking barriers with products aimed at women in a field known as femtech. People often think that we're selling sex toys, right? But we're not. Anything that we insert inside vagina is apparently considered a sex toy, and, but we're not. And scientists in Asia and Israel are studying artificial wombs that could one day save premature babies and much more. 15 million babies born preterm each year around the world, and that's almost certainly an underestimate. At least a million of those will die. The future of baby making might look very different. India, the second most populous country in the world, and soon to be number one. But there's another story here, declining fertility and distressed couples. Now we're both part of joint families. And, I mean, uh, you know, you go home and this is kind of the favourite topic, right? I mean, you would be told next time, please, we, we want three of you to come. <laughs> I think uh, it was funny at first and then it just got super irritating <laughs> later on. Alak and Sonam are one of many couples facing baby pressures in India. For the past four years, they've been trying to conceive through in vitro fertilization, or IVF. So we got the laparoscopy done and we were told that the fallopian tubes were blocked. In 2021, India's fertility rate dropped to two births per woman, the first time it's ever been below the replacement rate. This was hailed as diffusing a population bomb. But infertility is increasing here, especially among the young. An estimated 10 to 15% of the population have fertility issues. At a Mumbai hospital, an infertility expert is checking on an embryo. He's seeing an increasing number of patients. First factor which is affecting fertility uh, in the country is lifestyles are changing. Uh, then, of course, uh, another common factor is contamination in the general environment that may be contributing. Third is uh, STIs, infection. Another big player in our country has been tuberculosis. Tuberculosis can affect genital organs as well, can block the tubes, can damage the uterus, can damage the ovaries. Infertility and IVF are still sensitive topics for some people here. That's one of the reasons couples don't seek treatment. Initial few months, we did not inform our parents. So we were like, we have to manage our own anxiety. I cannot take your anxiety as of now. Uh, I think when we came out and we told them that uh, we told our parents that, you know, we're going through IVF and this is how the process goes. It's going to take some time, so you need to have patience. Uh, they were actually quite relieved, quite happy, and uh, thank God for that. They were, uh, they have been very supportive throughout. 
Fertility expert, Dr. Firuza Parikh, is a specialist assigned to Sonam's case. I saw the sad plight of women who were supposedly infertile. Here, we, I would see them with hopeless faces, no smiles on the face, and being treated badly by society. And I decided at that point that this is the field I want to specialize in. I want to bring smiles to the faces of women, to the faces of couples. She hopes society will gain a better understanding of assisted reproductive technology. IVF sometimes is considered unnatural. IVF is sometimes considered to give abnormal babies. So when all these stigmas and taboos and misunderstandings are removed, and when the science is explained to couples, I think that is the time when people will be more forthcoming. But IVF is expensive, and only 1% of infertile couples seek treatment. And I also believe that, like a lot of private practice, that we surely can also do contribute by doing what is known as individual social responsibility. As a healthcare provider, you have to discount yourself. You have to do social work by reducing your charges, you, but not at the cost of compromising the level of care. New and improved technology is now available for those struggling with infertility. Initially, IVF did not give good results. The results were very low. We have seen this technology evolve slowly and now by leaps and bounds. What we are seeing is this technology gives succor not just to infertile couples, but also to fertile couples who are bogged down with genetic diseases. Mumbai's Jaslok Hospital is among the first in the world using a new software backed by artificial intelligence. This software is called Ubar. The system is fed millions of data points with genetic and biochemical information about embryos from all over the world. The algorithm then predicts which embryos have the best chance of successful implantation. This technology is beautiful. It depends on the machine to keep learning and learning. So as the technology grows, as it sees more use, in fact, the costing would come down. And this kind of technology-driven work is what is going to give us good results. In Israel, one of the developers of the software being used in Mumbai is getting ready to launch her next AI offering in a few months. Yeah. Hi, Rory. How are you? Okay. Well, I just wanted to talk to you about the meeting next week and uh, if we're stand if we're getting to where we need to be. And it will be great to go over with the graphic designer, talk with Anna. Mm -hmm. From the very first days of embryonics, we understood that in order to disrupt the field of fertility and bring, you know, a tangible tools that will bring tangible improvement in success rates, it's not enough to have one piece of technology that focuses on one area or on one problem. Coming soon is AI to screen for genetic problems with embryos. The status quo is to take a tissue sample. First of all, you need to uh, go through an invasive biopsy that, and not always be embryos survive these biopsies. And, and the other drawbacks, of course, is price. And you need professional people who know how to do it. So we're able to rank the embryos according to their potential to be, um, you know, um, healthy, genetically healthy or not. And I'm talking about specifically about major conditions like Down syndrome and other chromosomal uh, defects that can be, um, we can screen. And then based on this pre-screening, get decisions of what embryos you want to biopsy or not. And I think this is, you know, very encouraging, especially for parents who have few embryos. This gynecologist turned businesswoman also wants to use algorithms to help before the embryo stage. AI will predict the best combination of hormones and treatment to help women produce eggs. 
that tool could be 18 months away. Being a fertility patient, going for fertility treatments, is you're paying a lot of prices, emotionally, physically, um, financially. My satisfaction is knowing that I'm building something that, can, that is relevant and important and can change lives of millions of people globally, because fertility is, is, is a growing need globally, and it's just the beginning. Another part of the fertility puzzle is sperm. Meet the people behind a booming donor industry. And for women, there are innovations to bring more maternal health care into the home. Denmark's second largest city has an interesting claim to fame. It's home to what's said to be the largest sperm bank in the world. This is a university town, so most donors are students. Virtual reality goggles are the latest addition, replacing traditional material. Because it has been proved in other studies that if you compare the quality of sperm from a man masturbating or a man having a, a sexual intercourse, the sperm quality is better when it's stimulated by sexual intercourse. So making it as lively as possible, we may be able to improve the quality of the ejaculate. The semen is taken into the lab. It takes months to become an approved donor, as checks are done on the man's family medical history and the quality of his sperm. Well, good sperm should be swimming <laughs> straight ahead. It shouldn't go round in circles. It shouldn't lie still. It should have one tail, not two. Uh, so so you, you look at it and you, you see how it looks. You know how a sperm cell should look like and you know how it should swim. As a clinical geneticist, I used to work in the private hospitals. In the private hospitals, we uh, see the patients once they have a genetic disease. Being a geneticist in a sperm bank, you are a step before that. You actually look at the family history before the genes are distributed, so you try to prevent uh, children getting genetic diseases. The sperm is stored in so-called straws in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees. So a sperm can be uh, frozen forever. The quality does not decline. If we thaw it the day after it has been frozen or we thaw it 20 years after it's been frozen, the quality is exactly the same. So there is no uh, limitation on the time or the years that we can store sperm. The lab is experiencing the busiest day of the year. Demand for sperm is growing after being hit by COVID-19. We export to more than 100 countries in the world, being all the way from Cambodia, Sri Lanka, and then, uh, of course, all the markets here in, in Europe. Uh, so we cover all over the world. It depends on the local legislation. Uh, so it's often that that stands in the way of uh, women being able to, to purchase from us. When I first started here, I think a lot of people, they were, they were all giggling. So what are you doing in the sperm bank business? Because they felt, okay, that's a little bit, you know, you can, you can make a lot of fun of it. But actually what I've seen is the business is very serious. It's, uh, it's an amazing, you know, all the research that actually goes into it. I think it's uh, nice to see people working in a sperm bank because they have a feeling of doing something good. We all have a feeling of uh, contributing to something very great. So it's a, 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 nice, a nice working environment.
In the marketing department is a young woman with a special connection to the company. Emma Gronbeck was conceived with donor sperm that was provided here. At home, she shares her experiences online and offers advice. I'm in the process to become a solo mother by choice. Any recommendations uh, for me from your perspective? Okay. So my recommendation would be that you are open to conversations with your child and tell the truth from the beginning so that there is no secrets in your family. When people heard about me being donor conceived, they didn't really know how to react because all the things they'd ever heard about it was something negative. So I wanted to create a more like diverse picture of what donor conception could be like. I have known that I was donor conceived since forever. My parents did like a children's book that they read to me as a nighttime story from I was three years old or something like that. So I've grown up knowing that I was donor conceived. And um, I think it has made me very secure in myself and in my family because I felt like I was a very, very wanted child. I think the most important thing was that my parents told the truth. Um, I do have an anonymous donor. Um, it's not been a problem to me, but it can be to some people. Now, her parents even take part in online Q&A sessions. We were relatively rational about that uh, Henning's, your father's sperm count was so low that our chances of conceiving would be really, really slim without that help. My name is Henning and I'm uh, Emma's father and uh, very happy about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, having Emma made us a family and at that time, back in 96. Emma hopes her story will become more common in other parts of the world where similar fertility trends are emerging. And I think that the most important thing is love. And um, if we end up in a place where people who love each other and want children um, have the possibility of, of creating the family that they dream of, I think that would be amazing. I've definitely seen a positive change um, in people opening up, breaking down taboos. Yeah and I'm very, very happy to see it move in that direction. So there will be many more people like Emma as attitudes and technology change. Also changing is how maternal health care is moving away from hospitals. In a Tel Aviv suburb, 27-year-old Hila is expecting her second child. She's preparing for an ultrasound exam, but this time she's doing it herself. So I have a lot of stress and a lot of worries about this uh, having uh, this pregnancy. For before this pregnancy, I had uh, two miscarriages, so it's uh, it's a main issue uh, for me. The device attaches to a standard mobile phone. It can check on heartbeat, fetal movement and even amniotic fluid. The resulting video is uploaded for specialists to view. I can tell you that my previous pregnancy, when I have my son, uh, I have a lot of worries. I go to a hospital for each pain, each uh, comfortable. When I don't feel comfortable, I'm going to the hospital. Now I don't need it. It really make me feel comfortable. It make me feel uh, secure. I can observe my baby. I can see the pulse. I can see the movement. I can see it moving. I can see it alive. It's like happening. She's now more confident about growing her family. We are raised to be a mother and father and family and big one. I want uh, three kids, kids, hopefully it's uh, ten. Um, so uh, my son is everything for me. Just to think about having another one like him, it's uh, great. <laughs> One of Israel's most experienced ultrasound specialists 
supported the development of the new device. He thinks it's a game changer. This is the face. You see, this is one orbit. You can see the spine. Imagine in, in places, in rural places, where you don't have medical centers everywhere, like in big cities, and the woman is scanning her fetus and something is wrong, and she sends this, this, the movie to the doctor, and he says, listen, come immediately to the hospital, there is a problem with the fetus. And she rushes to the hospital, and then they save the baby's life. This is something that couldn't have been done before if you didn't do the ultrasound by yourself and send the pictures. So, it's, it's I mean, the, the, the entire surveillance of pregnancy is going to be changed. Someone leading that change is an OBGYN specialist at Israel's largest medical center. He's running a pilot telemedicine project for women with gestational diabetes. One week, the women do the ultrasound themselves at home. The next week, they come into the hospital. It was a pandemic that brought the technology to the forefront. We had pregnant women and women that have delivered with COVID-19, and we started treating them in the hospital uh, remotely. They, they collect, connected themselves to the fetal monitor, into the ultrasound, and then we saw how simple it is. We said, OK, we need to start sending it to, uh, to home. So today's visit was uh, very successful. Uh, maternal side, the uh, patient had uh, no complaints, no contractions, no bleeding, no rupture of membranes, and uh, she feels the baby moving uh, well. The team is making a video to share their work with others. And they have big plans for the technology, here and elsewhere. Could be a patient in the East Coast, or in Germany, or in France, or in Israel. And once we uh, take out this uh, geographic limitation and each patient can find the doctor that can help most the problem she has and also uh, address the economics of what she can pay for the treatment, I think it's a totally, it's a totally new world for medicine. The team is part of a newly formed virtual hospital. The head of the hospital says it will only grow. I actually believe that in maternity care, in the future, everything except the, the maybe C-sections can be done at home. Gradually, it will go to home. People won't have to come for, has, to the hospital for, for workups or, or uh, visits uh, for clinicians because technology will help us to do it in the house. It's already there. The technology is already there. We have to gain much more experience and much more belief in the technology uh, to see that it can really work and gradually will be fully at home. So the trend is to bring pregnancy and fertility care out of traditional hospitals wherever possible. It's also turning into big business as the world of femtech takes shape. In Japan, there's a startup company in the relatively new field of femtech. That's the term for female technology designed to empower women's health and well being. In a small office above the store is the startup's co founder, Amina Sugimoto. Women's health is largely neglected. There are areas within healthcare that are definite needs, hidden needs. Um, the second thing is there are a lot of investments happening around health tech. Femtech was one of the emerging sort of market. And it's big business. Globally, the femtech industry is expected to be worth 75 billion US dollars annually by 2025. Amina turned heads when she launched a femtech festival three years ago. Half of the product, I didn't know how to use even, but I just display it as an art exhibition. And I wanted to also figure out um, how people react, how willing people are to you know, attend these events. 
And it turned out that over 150 people appeared from north of Japan, Hokkaido to Osaka. That's when I figured, one, this definitely, it's not a niche market. People want to talk about it. Located in the heart of Tokyo, Amina's store sells a variety of femtech products. They include menstrual underwear, menstrual cups, and devices to help conception. When I started Farmata in Japan, people often think that we're selling sex toys, right? But we're not. Uh, anything that we insert inside vagina is apparently considered a sex toy, and, but we're not. After a slow start, the femtech sector is taking off in Japan. The 2021 Femtech Festival in Tokyo attracted 1,500 visitors. Recently, Amina helped convince government officials to include funding for Femtech in the budget. Japan started to change slightly, that there are now a lot more women in their decision-making position. And those ladies struggle in their uh, career life uh, with period or, you know, with fertility problems, having babies, pregnancy, menopause, but they couldn't say anything about it and that they struggle. So I think now that we brought femtech sort of industry with an impact, they now see it and they now see it as their responsibility to change something within their uh, ability. More companies in Japan are now investing in femtech. Amina is on her way to meet one of them, and she's bringing her products with her. Today, she's meeting Kentaro Toma, who shares a personal interest in the products. あの、少しでも解決できるような Back at the office, Amina's getting ready for a trip to Singapore, where she's expanding her company. She's hoping to do a small scale femtech event. As she sets up, she hopes it'll be the first of many events like this. Japan is a big market, but I think there's a ceiling. Where Singapore, I don't think there's a ceiling. It seems like the rest of Southeast Asian country seem to be looking what's happening in Singapore too. So if things go big here, the same movement tend to probably follow by other neighboring countries too. Another benefit I think is that this country is very diverse community, right? So for, for people, for like femtech entrepreneurs to, to, to try to, those who are trying to come up with an innovative product, they are actually interested more in a community and population that are more diverse than homogenous and can be applied in other parts of the world as well. Thanks for coming. Thank you. The next day, the festival gets underway. The participants include other femtech companies and potential investors. It's not painful. You just insert inside your bra. They're most selling breast pump in the US now, in Europe, and they're coming to Japan now. As the industry expands over the next few years, Amina has big hopes. I, you know, I always tell people like, I really envision the world where we don't no longer have to use the term femtech. It will soon become a part of health tech and this product will become really available at department stores and um, yeah, supermarkets or pharmacies. Among the products are conception devices, including one designed by a local. Benjamin T 
went through his own struggles to conceive with his wife. Well, first of all, we went through all the checks and unfortunately we were diagnosed with unexplained infertility. You know, we decided to go through IVF, although it's a very painful process, and you know, we, we, we succeeded. So we succeeded through IVF. The entire journey was extremely painful and long for both myself and my wife with many injections. It was invasive. And I wanted to create something that couples can use in the freedom of their home and the privacy of their home uh, to help them conceive faster. And that's kind of how we started to look at technologies that could help and the science of conception. Benjamin co-founded the company in the hopes of providing an affordable and natural method of conception. We developed our first product, the Sperm Guide, essentially to increase the chances of conception every time couples try. The device is designed to minimize leakage of semen post-intercourse. It's inserted into the vagina prior to sex. After ejaculation, the male withdraws and a flap springs up. This blocks the backflow of semen, channeling the sperm to swim to the fallopian tubes and increase the chance of fertilizing an egg. So, frankly, when we launched the product, we were taken aback and surprised by the overwhelming response. I mean, at some point, we actually even ran out of uh, inventory because we didn't expect the, the amount of demand. And we realized that there's a gap, you know, that current invasive procedures may not be able to feel for majority of couples who may not need to go to IUI or IVF, but want something that they can boost their chances earlier on in their journey. So, so far we have over a thousand couples using our products both in Singapore and United Kingdom. And we have several pregnancies both in Singapore and UK, which we are very proud of. Okay, great. Good afternoon. Today, Benjamin is meeting a couple of investors to share more about his sperm guide. When you took, look at femtech specifically, Asia is only 10% of the femtech market globally nowadays. And so there's a lot of room for growth. So we're starting to see more and more products come out from you know, this part of the world, which are very exciting, particularly because there's a lot of cultural nuance in the region. And I think all companies coming out of Asia are better positioned to be sensitive to the, those cultural nuances and, and you know, positioned well to grow versus some of the international players coming into the market. So it's a, it's a market we're, we're keeping a close eye on. I think there's going to be more and more solutions coming out. Thanks a lot, Ben. Very nice meeting you. Thank you so much for your time. Back to you with next steps. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Benjamin himself has more products available. In a lab, staff are testing and improving another offering that he thinks is greatly needed. We also realize that many couples don't have good data around their health and their hormonal health, especially. And so we also have launched multiple products now, uh, such as the hormone test that they can do at the comfort of their home in order to get accurate data around their hormone levels, which have a very dramatic impact on fertility. And also at the same time, the earlier couples know about their fertility health, which is a stigma around Asia, maybe, maybe many parts of the world. The earlier you can understand and, and seek treatment if you need. I think if I didn't have the, I would say, opportunity to experience the, the stress and the emotional burden of conception, uh, I probably would not have started 2 plus. And this journey made me realize that many couples in the world are facing the same issues. And as an engineer myself, I wanted to create an impact. And there's nothing probably more impactful than creating life. But high-tech solutions are also moving forward there are some startling new developments in the world of science. A premature baby is fighting for its life. Its lungs are simply not ready for the outside world. 
What would help babies like this survive better? A team of researchers is in Western Australia to do studies on artificial wombs. They're focusing for now on lamb fetuses. Matt Kemp is based in Singapore and his colleagues are visiting from Japan. The quest is to help premature human babies born on the edge of survival at about 21 to 23 weeks of gestation. The ones who make it often have severe health problems. It varies, but you know, certainly cerebral palsy, blindness, uh, cardiopulmonary disease. So you know, significant uh, lifelong health challenges, and they you know they they impact the individual and of course the family, uh, but they also have a fairly significant uh, health system cost as well. Masatoshi Saito is an obstetrician who's been doing this research for more than 15 years. Sometimes I cannot uh, save the uh, baby, premature baby. So uh, that's the reason I, uh, I want to do uh, some research. Uh, and uh, I really want to save that uh, premature baby. Maybe I can do more for that baby. That's, that's my feeling. So the, the, one of the rationale around this is really to try to take advantage of the anatomy and the physiology of these babies, treat them a bit more like fetuses, rather than trying to rush them to adapt to life outside of the uterus. So this nifty little device here is actually our artificial placenta. And we take this and we use these circuit connectors to link it into the umbilical cord of the fetus. And then once that procedure is complete, we take the artificial placenta and the fetus, and we place it inside our artificial uterus here, and then we close that up and we commence our treatment process. The lamb is suspended in a liquid electrolyte solution that acts as artificial amniotic fluid. Tubes attached to the umbilical cord bring blood out to the artificial placenta. It's oxygenated here and then sent back to the fetus. The whole process is driven by the fetal heart, with no external pressure added. That scissors, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, the fetus has grown. They grow uh, at, at a rate that we think is, is normal. Uh, so at a, at a gross level, their long bones grow, they get bigger, uh, they start to develop wool and they move around like you, you hope a fetus would as well. So they, they flex and they extend and they, uh, they swallow and breathe uh, and they sleep. So it's, it's pretty remarkable. It's, it really brings home, I think, the importance of, of what we're trying to do and you know, really the importance of getting this to work. In uh, 2007, 2008, I, I saw a huge number of failed uh, study, uh, but now, uh, we can get a, a huge number of the success. So I, 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 feel, I feel good, I feel good. And also, uh, so I feel uh, the future is, is very bright. As well as the sheep, similar experiments with monkeys are just months away. Their fetuses are more similar to human ones. Masatoshi has a response for critics who question the research. Just I said, oh, we need, we need to do that uh, to get a to get a development in medical system. Yeah, that's the answer we need. It's a huge unmet need. You know, preterm birth is uh, you know leading cause of under five death in, in places like Singapore, Australia, and Japan. 15 million babies born preterm each year around the world, and that's almost certainly an underestimate. At least a million of those will die. It is a huge global health challenge that has lifelong consequences for, for individuals and families. And it just strikes me as something that's, you know, terribly unfair, uh, this really difficult start to life for, for so many 
uh, so many people. And if we can do something about it, then I, I think we should. Back in his own lab, Matt takes advantage of local expertise in molecular analysis. This is helping to understand how organs develop during the experiments. Human trials could be about 10 years away. But he pushes back against talk of fetuses growing completely outside the womb. And that's a little bit like saying, well, if you can hop in, a, in an Airbus and fly from, from Singapore to Perth, then you can just tweak it a little bit and then you can go to the moon. It's, it's, it's quite, a, it's, it's quite a, a leap, really, and it's, it's, I think it's not really reflective of actually what the technology is or does uh, and what it can be used for. At a renowned science facility in Israel, a team led by Jacob Hanna is also doing artificial womb research with huge potential down the road. They've shown in the past year that they can take mouse embryos from the mother and keep them alive outside the uterus for about a third of the entire pregnancy. The new uterus is a glass tube where early stage embryos are kept in a nutrient rich serum. They're spun so they don't implant on the sides. These early days of development are crucial for mammals and could give insight into human disorders. And this happens actually very quickly and within a couple of days. Uh, in the mouse, in humans, this takes about two weeks process. And this is really when most of the drama is happening. It's the most dramatic morphological changes in the, in, in the shape and in the organ formation. It, it is important to realize that this sh relatively short period in which the, the organ formation happens is really the period when usually things could go wrong. For example, most birth defects originate from defects that are happening due this, during this process. The team estimates about 80% of the embryos are nearly identical to those growing inside a mouse uterus. So I think this is really highlighting to us that the embryo is a really independent self-organizing entity, so it doesn't need the uterus to make the correct shape. But there's a twist. None of these are natural embryos. The team has moved on to using stem cells from skin and blood that have the ability to create embryo-like structures or embryoids without a fertilized egg. So you can see here now, this is a day 10 embryo. You can see here the heartbeat. You can also see the red because they already have a blood supply. It's, it's very exciting, but I mean, as scientists, we are, we're always greedy. By the, to, you know, yesterday's news is already old news. We're now thinking about the next step, but in a positive way. It's a validation of, of our logic of trying to, really to make, you know, how to grow the natural embryo first, and then that that would allow us to grow the synthetic embryos, which, which has happened. Applied to humans, the research would be a massive breakthrough. People with infertility or other ailments would use synthetic embryos to help them become their own donors. You can have progenitors of eggs or progenitors of sperm or blood progenitors and harvest these progenitors that can be then expanded and transplanted back to the same patient. And again, in this case, the DNA is identical, so there is no need, there are no difference in DNA, and there is no need to look for donors. Um, and that is something we want to explore and hopefully make a reality. So we're, we're going to be very busy for the next 10 years, I would say, and exciting. I think there are going to be some failures, but I think there are going to be a lot of successes as well. And even further ahead, what's possible? The question and, and the idea of, of you know, can we really uh, achieve and recapitulate entire mammalian uh, pregnancy outside the uterus is an important one. And yes, we cannot overlook it. I mean, pregnancy, there are a lot of issues with, with women who suffer from what's called uh, uterine insufficiency and hard to maintain pregnancy or early uh, 
uh, early delivery and, that, and so forth. So there is a clinical justification to do that, but I think we're still far ahead. So it's gonna take a lot of uh, development and time, I think, to reach this. However, I do think that it can become a reality one day. As fertility evolves, there are still many technological and ethical considerations to figure out. But the future of baby making is going to look different. As societies grapple with the question of how many humans do we need? And what are we prepared to do to get them? <laughs>